on the sixth day of creation, after that first primordial light had been spoken into being, after the water had been separated from water to create heaven and earth, after seed-bearing plants and the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and the animals that creep and walk and jump upon the earth had all come teeming forth, <coughs> after all of this, the Torah tells us, God created us. Let us make human beings in our image after our likeness, God said. And so God created the human beings Bitsalmo in the divine image, creating them B'Tselem Elohim in the image of God, creating them male and female. The story of creation that begins the Torah is among the mis most misused and most maligned texts in the history of scripture, from monkey trials to censored textbooks. But when I was a teenager, my rabbi, Rabbi Rick Jacobs, now the president of our reform movement, taught me that the mistake people make about Genesis is trying to use it to answer the wrong question. The Torah's account of creation is not meant to answer the question of how human life began. Only science can tell us that. The Torah's interest is to tell a story that answers a very different kind of question. Why? Why are we here? What is our purpose? What is the nature of human existence? The Torah has much to say about these enormous questions, and it offers more than one answer. But one of the most important answers and I believe the answer that our world needs most today comes from this passage in Genesis. The essence of our being is that we are created B'Tselem Elohim in God's image. This idea the ancient sage Ben Azai taught is the great principle of all of Torah. Pause for a moment and consider this magnificent irony. The religion that invented the revolutionary idea of a God who cannot be seen, a God who is transcendent beyond, beyond any one form, a God of whom we are forbidden to make any sculptured image, whose face no human being can see and live, that same religion also teaches that it is after God's image, God's own likeness, that we human beings are created. This idea, this mystery, is core to Jewish wisdom. Of course, most sages interpret the phrase more metaphorically. They don't consider that the resemblance that links humanity to God is a visual or a physical one. Some commentators insist that the resemblance really is a physical one in some sense, but others conjecture that it is maybe about a particular character trait that human beings share in common with God, like the ability to speak or the ability to love. My teacher, Rabbi Shai Held, points out that over the centuries, scholars have interpreted being created in God's image to refer to a range of attributes, including our ability to reason, the fact that we have free will, our potential for generosity, Modern biblical scholars often understand the phrase as signifying our responsibility as caretakers for all of creation. While there's a diversity of interpretations about what B'Tselem Elohim might refer to, there is significantly more agreement about its consequences. Today, I want to explore six lessons that Judaism derives from this great principle of the Torah, that all human beings are made in God's image because I think they are some of the most urgent lessons for our time. You don't need to believe in God to believe in their wisdom. They are all, after all, fundamentally teachings about humanity. These six lessons can help us cut through the fog of a world where so much seems to be broken that we don't know where to start. If we take them to heart, they will illuminate our way out of this brokenness. Lesson number one. The 
The belief that each of us is created in God's image means that every single human life has infinite value. To say that we are created in the image of God means that each of us has a spark of God inside of us, that each of us has a glimpse, however small and limited, of the divine. In mathematical terms, a fraction of infinity is still infinity. That spark means that even though you and I are but dust and ashes, even as we are mere mortals, even as we are imperfect and prone to sin and error, still each of us has infinite value that is in no way dependent on what we can accomplish or produce, on the mistakes that we have made, on how we are viewed by society. And this is true for all of us, as much as it is for any one of us. This profound idea was a radical notion in the ancient world, but even today we are far from actualizing it. Rabbi Yitz Greenberg observes that a Van Gogh painting once sold for $82.5 million, but an image created by God is worth infinitely more than a Van Gogh. One should note, he writes, that such Van Goghs are stored in rooms with climate control and cared for with every caution lest they be damaged in any way. That human beings are allowed to lie on the street, homeless and freezing in winter, is a fundamental violation of that intrinsic value. To believe in B'Tselem Elohim is to know that we must not allow ourselves to become numb to the obscenity of that violation. We cannot become acclimated to the news of children being gunned down in schools or on sidewalks. And we cannot allow others to simply nod their heads sadly when elderly Jews are gunned down in synagogues. We cannot let our eyes glaze over when we read the calculations of how many souls in some other part of the world might die because this past week, our country once again lowered the cap on the number of refugees, people fleeing violence, persecution, and disaster, whom we will allow into our country. The cap proposed this past Thursday for 2019 is the lowest ever proposed in American history, down almost 84% from three years ago. This is true even though the number of refugees this year is the highest figure ever recorded. Can we prevent all of those deaths? Of course not. But we are obligated to do as much as we possibly can because every single one of those people, every single one, is a loss beyond measure. To accept the Torah's teaching of B'Tselem Elohim is to fight back against the numbness that our brains put on as a kind of protection. When the losses are so staggering that your instinct is to look away, you must instead find the strength to stare them in the face and let the weight of those losses bear down on you. Lesson number two. Because we are created in God's image, every single person has inherent dignity that must be protected. If you dishonor your fellow, Rabbi Tanahuma taught in the mid-fourth century, you should remember who you are really dishonoring. In the likeness of God are human beings created. The spark of God within each person, Rabbi Tanahuma teaches, means that insulting the dignity of any person is tantamount to insulting God. And this applies to all of us, no matter what wrong we have committed, or what we look like, or where we come from. This lesson is important because we might think that protecting what is tangible, people's lives, their health, their property, is the main thing that we should be concerned about, not something as intangible as honor. But as one medieval sage taught, there is, quote, no principle more highly prized in Judaism than kavod habriot, human dignity. This principle is not just rhetorical but it's actually encoded into Jewish law. You may know that while Jewish law 
includes many strictures about activities that are forbidden on Shabbat that Orthodox and some conservative Jews still observe traditionally. Any of these laws, even by someone who is very Orthodox, can be and in fact must be violated if you need to do some, if you need to do so in order to save somebody's life. What's less frequently discussed is that some of the laws of Shabbat are also set aside for the sake of preserving a person's dignity. The example given in the Talmud that I once learned from my colleague, Rabbi Melissa Weintraub, is not some lofty example concerning the honor of scholars or kings, but the pretty quotidian issue of personal hygiene. Imagine it is Shabbat, one of the, Talmud, well, one of the Talmud's rabbis teaches, and a person goes to use the bathroom in a place where there is essentially, in ancient terms, no toilet paper. But getting some would require violating a law of Shabbat. So the Talmud asks, should he go and get something to wipe himself with, even though doing that would involve violating Shabbat? Yes, the Talmud answers, he is permitted to do so, because human dignity is so important, it supersedes a law given in the Torah. Now, I don't usually spend Rosh Hashanah preaching about the importance of toilet paper. But in June, lawyers for our government argued in court that they were not required to provide detained migrant children with personal hygiene items such as soap, toothpaste, or diapers. This is how the New York Times described a Texas detention center for children who had recently entered our country. Some of them had been in this facility for nearly a month. Children as young as seven or eight, many of them wearing clothes caked with snot and tears, are caring for infants they've just met, the lawyers said. Toddlers without diapers are relieving themselves in their pants. They have no access to toothbrushes, toothpaste, or soap. There is a stench, said Elora Mukherjee, director of the Immigrants' Right Clinic at Columbia Law School. One of the lawyers who visited the facility said, the overwhelming majority of children have not bathed since they crossed the border. The stench of the children's dirty clothing was so strong, it spread to the Border Patrol agent's own clothing. People in town, they said, would scrunch their noses when they left work. The problems are not limited to the one detention center. The Inspector General for the Department of Homeland Security described how some detainees at some facilities had, quote, been held in standing room only conditions for days or weeks. The report described people standing up on toilets just to find a spot where it was easier to breathe, quote, thus limiting access to the toilets. The first century sage Rabbi Eliezer taught, other people's dignity should be as important to you as your own. It's almost 2,000 years later, but we are still in need of this lesson. Lesson number three. Not only some of us, but all of humanity is created in God's image, which means that no group and no one person is greater than any other. Does that seem obvious? Good. Sometimes the point of Torah is not to tell us what we don't know, but to remind us of what we claim to know, but do not live up to. Many of us in this room have at one point in our lives experienced what it is like to be treated unequally, whether it was because we were Jews, or because of our sex, our race, our sexual orientation, our gender identity, our age, our disabilities, or another factor. The teaching of B'Tselem Elohim is a reminder that inequality is not only a social problem, but also a religious one. If we fail to see the equal worth of all people, we are failing to perceive God's presence in its most abundant form all around us. My teacher, Rabbi Eugene Borowitz of blessed memory, the leading Reformed Jewish theologian of our day, used to advise his students to take advantage of the daily ride on a New York City subway that most of us took to get to his class. 
to do an exercise to strengthen our spiritual muscles. Now, these days I don't take the subway so often, but I do try to think of this exercise still sometimes, waiting in line, sitting in traffic, or anywhere I find myself in an especially diverse crowd of people. Perhaps you might too. Look at each person on the subway, Rabbi Borowitz told us. People of different sizes and backgrounds and ages and colors, speaking different languages, dressed in different ways. Look at each person, one person at a time. Look at them deeply and say to yourself, until you really understand the truth of it, this person was created in the image of God. And then the next person, this person is the image of God. This person is the image of God. Lesson number four. Being created in God's image, but selim Elohim, means that every person is unique, not to be stereotyped as part of a group. The Talmud asks us to imagine an ordinary process of minting coins. All the coins are made from one mold, and therefore, all of them look exactly alike. But the Holy One of Blessing, the Talmud teaches, although the Holy One of Blessing also made human beings from one mold, from our single ancestor, Adam, still no human being is exactly like another one. The rabbis didn't know about genetic variation as we would explain it, but they believe that the stuff of which we were made has a spark of something sacred, something infinite in it, within it, and that that spark of infinity shines differently inside each person. Just as it is idolatrous to elevate one race or sex or group above another, so too is it a kind of blasphemy to lump people together on the basis of external characteristics rather than seeing what is unique and godly in each person. These generalizations, I think, are especially tempting for us to make when it comes to perceptions of people whose politics differ from our own. So for the Democrats in this room, I'd like you to make a guess in your head what percentage of Republicans still believe that racism is a problem in our country? Republicans in the room? What percentage of Democrats would you guess suspect that the majority of police officers are bad people? If you're an independent, you can feel free to come up with a guess for both. So these questions come from a study released this summer by More in Common, an advocacy and research group dedicated to fighting extremism. Overall, most Democrats guessed that about 50% of Republicans would acknowledge racism as a problem, and Republicans guessed that about 50% of racism, of 50% of Democrats would agree that most police officers are bad people. Here are the real numbers. In fact, 79% of Republicans agree that racism is still a problem, while 85% of Democrats disagreed with the statement maligning police officers. Americans have a deeply distorted understanding of each other, the authors of this study conclude. We call this America's perception gap. Overall, Democrats and Republicans imagine that almost twice as many of their political opponents hold views that they consider extreme. And people who say that they read the news most of the time were nearly three times more distorted in their perceptions than those who only read the news every now and then. These findings matter, they write, because when people wrongly perceive each other as extreme, they become more hostile toward them. People with large perception gaps are more likely to describe their opponents as hateful, ignorant, or bigoted. Lesson number five, being made in God's image means that each of us has a unique mission and a unique responsibility in this world. Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik, one of the leading voices of modern Orthodox Judaism in the 20th century, taught that God created human beings in the divine image because God needed partners to help fulfill some of God's worth, work here on earth. In order to serve as God's agents, the people needed to have various godlike qualities and attributes. 
but why wouldn't God have just picked a couple human beings to be God's partners and then created those people with God-like abilities so that they could have the, the abilities necessary to do their work? Instead, God made all of us in the divine image. This implies, Rabbi Soloveitchik taught, that God created every human being in the divine image because God has specific missions or assignments for every one of us. You have been blessed with an aspect of God that nobody else has. Because God needed you to do some piece of work in the world, however small, that no one else can do. Your missions, Rabbi Soloveitchik taught, are based not only on who you are and what your gifts are, but just as importantly, on the time and place that you were born into. This is part of your responsibility, this Rosh Hashanah, to find and fulfill the pieces of God's work that you were meant to do. Lesson number six. If we are made in God's image, then we also have the ability to fulfill these missions. Did that last lesson seem hopelessly abstract or impossibly out of reach? Does it seem naive to believe that in a time as overwhelming as our current day is, that you can actually make a difference in any way at all, let alone in some way that has cosmic significance? Just as it is idolatrous to fail to see the sparks in others, to stereotype them, or to fail to see them in their, hu in their own full humanity, so too is it a sin not to see the image in yourself. Being made in God's image, we have some part, some small part of God's power. God has created us as partners in tikkun olam, the repair of the world. And because we are created in the divine image, we are capable of our role in that partnership. Friends, this is what it means to have faith. To have faith in God is to have faith in those sparks, in that image. And to have faith in that image is to have faith in ourselves. The challenge is overwhelming, but we have the ability to meet the challenge. Six lessons. Every human life is infinitely valuable. Every human being has inherent dignity. We are all equal. We are all unique. We all have our own sacred work to do in this world, work that nobody else is capable of doing. And we can do it. God is counting on us. These truths are timeless, but this year demands that we have the courage to speak them anew and to live them. But Selim Elohim, in the image of God, were we created. Or rather, in the image of God, were you created. This is your gift. This is your responsibility. This is the stuff of which your soul is made. Shana Tova.